Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Baptist Church here in Grayton, California. We uh, welcome you to uh, come and visit us anytime you're in the area. Uh, we have Bible study at 9.30 on Sunday mornings, and it goes until 10.30, and then worship starts at 11 a.m., Today is, as most of you know, today is the eve of the new year, the last day of 2023, and I, <laughs> for many of us, 2023 has been horrendous, and so we all look forward to uh, the upcoming new year with its freshness. But I ask that we consider also to look at every day as a new day. Especially when you wake up in the morning, it's like God must not be finished with you yet if you woke up. You know what I'm saying? All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Most Heavenly Father, God, Creator God, we thank you for all of the rain here in uh, Northern California. It's been wonderful to uh, see the earth be rejuvenated with the moisture that it so needs. To see the plants, the trees, all that you have created just getting greener and more plush. And we thank you for that, Lord. We know that you regenerate us each and every moment. And we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we lift up to you those that don't know you. As we go from the old year into the new year, Lord, uh, we continue to ask that you use this church, this body of believers Lord, use us and help us to know our direction each and every day as to where you would have us focus. Lord, we know our focus is on those who do not know you. Help us to individually focus, each one of us individually, and then on the individuals, Lord, that you would put in our path. We ask you for divine moments, day in and day out. We ask that you help us to remember that with those divine moments, with those moments where you've put somebody in our path so that when we speak to them, Lord, we know that you give us the words that need to be spoken. Help us to keep ourselves clean, keep ourselves cleansed of anything that separates us from you. Lord, we want to... Uh, Stay as close to you as possible. We want to continually hear and acknowledge your voice. And if we don't keep ourselves cleansed, if we are sinning, Lord, that separates us from you. And so we ask that as well, Lord, that you help each one of us to know what it is that we might be doing that is causing a separation from you, Lord. As it says in one of the Psalms, search me, O Lord. And so, Lord, I individually and then corporately ask that you search us, O Lord. Lord, be with all of those that are not here. Be with um, our sister Kitty. Uh, hold on to her tightly, Lord. She wants to be here, but she's not been feeling well. And we also ask that you be with Charlene. We ask, Lord, that the company that she works for will be more into granting her Sundays off, or at least the morning, so that she may attend worship service, Lord. And give her the boldness, Lord, give her the boldness to speak up. Thank you so much for those who are here today for getting out of their warm bed and traipsing forth. Some of us 
driving short, short distances, some of us driving long distances. Lord, but it's not about each one of us, it's about you. And our every waking moment, our every moment of breath is about glorifying you, not glorifying ourselves. And Lord, uh, as always, we ask all of these things in the through your son's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Right in your bulletin, you will see the collect of the day. And if you are so led, please read it with me. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, our first worship song is number 140 in your hymnal, Down at the Cross. 140. I know it's still December, but I thought this, this was a good song for today. 140. I noticed as we were singing this in two verses, the third or the fourth verse, right at the very beginning, it mentions the fountain. 
I can remember the first time I read that in a hymn. It's like, I was saying to myself, what fountain is it talking about? We're not going to do it, uh, but on the next page, 142, there's a song called There is a Fountain. And it references uh, Zechariah 13, which talks about there will be a fountain opened. So just for reference, if you ever want to go take a look at that. Maybe that's a good topic for a sermon one day about the fountain that's opened. Okay, our next song is number 476. If you haven't done this in a while, be strong in the Lord. And isn't that what each one of us needs to remember, that God is our strength. That we find our strength in Him, we find our courage. Excuse me. that when you come upon or we come upon a time where there's a huge battle going on around us that we remember these words and the theme is throughout the scripture about being strong in God and how the battle is his it's not ours it's his and that he's got it he's got your back he's got your front he's got your six as they say in the military we need to rest and hold on to him no matter what's going on in the world. Because he's got it. He's under control. He's on the throne. He is our sufficiency. One of the things that I've come to find or that I have experienced as different things are going on in the world and as different uh, things are happening in my life personally that words of the scripture come and hold on to me and guide me and comfort me and in different songs pop up as well. This song right here, Be 
And we're just saying be strong in the Lord. It's one that pops up often. <laughs> and it really is all about letting go and letting God. It's um, not time for um, our time and offerings. And um, I will just go ahead and sing an offertory prayer and then we'll get to the pastor's sermon. Most Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for all of your provisions. We thank you for every single solitary thing that we have. We know that you are the God who provides. We know that everything that we have comes from you. Lord, help each one of us corporately and individually to know what it is that you would have us to give back. Some people say it's 10%. Some people say it's no percent. Lord, help each one of us know. Place it on our hearts. We know from scripture that you like a joyful giver. We know that the money, that the stuff, that the things that we have are ours. We know that they came from you. But Lord, guide us in how you would have us to give back. As always, Lord, we ask this in through your son's precious name. Amen. Uh, the pastor's sermon today is titled Sin, S-I-N. He's, he's going to be in Ezekiel 18, 19 through 32. One of my favorite things about Ezekiel is where Ezekiel writes, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Watchman on the hill. The watchman not on the hill, the watchman on the tower. And the watchman yells out and warns the people that the enemy's coming. And the watchman has done his job. May the Lord use each one of us as his watchman. And may we shout out. And more so, Lord, may the people listen to the warning that is being shouted out. Pastor. Good morning. Happy New Year's Eve. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day today. So we're going to be uh, in Ezekiel for a little bit here. I don't know how often you uh, have Bible studies or sermons on uh, Old Testament, but there's an awful lot there. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught out of it, or out of the scriptures that we now call the Old Testament. <clears throat> so if you open your Bibles to uh, Ezekiel 18, verse 19, one of the things we're going to see here is Ezekiel, in the previous verses before where we're starting, um, we find it, there was much written about what the Lord had told him in order to tell us. And one of the things is that every human belongs to the Lord. Now, previously, Scripture taught that the sins of the Father go down to the sons for several generations. And you actually will see elsewhere where it says sins of the mother go to the daughters for several generations. There's a mistake in this in how many people interpret it is that it's not a curse. It's not a predestination that this will go, go on for several gener generations. What it is is that, is that um, children frequently imitate their parents. Have you ever imitated your parents? So, though a father sinned, the son will not be punished if he does not sin. So, what are we talking about here? What it is, is that simply put, sin is disobeying God. Now, if you have trouble understanding what disobedience is, uh, though there are many commandments God gives us, there's the big ten that you can read about, the ten commandments. Take a look at how well uh, you follow those. Do you lie? Do you have uh, sex outside of a biblical marriage? Uh, there's all kinds of uh, uh, ways. Do you covet something? Do you, do you take time for the Lord every week for your own Sabbath with, with him? Do you swear? Do you only worship one God? So there's things to keep in mind. 
Now what happens is with this um, so-called curse of the, of the uh, sins of the father going down to the sons for several generations, it take, usually it takes several generations for the lights to go on and one of the children to say, oh, wait a minute, this isn't working for me. And then they'd return to God and things work out well. So what we see here in Ezekiel is we need to reflect on how we look upon sin. And God does not approve of sin. It's not approved. It's, 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 it really, sin is bad. So the first thing we see, we'll be looking at verses 19 through 23, is that we are shown that a person who turns from his sin and turns to God will be saved. So turning away from his sin and turning to God is a saving situation. The verses. Yet you ask, why does a son not share the guilt of his father? Since the son has done what is just, and right, and has been careful to keep all my decrees, he will surely live. His soul who sins is the one who will die. The son will not share the guilt of the father, nor will the father share the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous man will be credited to him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against him. But if a wicked man turns away from all the sins he has committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, he will surely live. He will not die. None of the offenses he has committed will be remembered against him because of the righteous things he has done. He will live. Do I take pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the sovereign Lord, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? What God is telling us here, through Ezekiel, who wrote this book, he's a major prophet, that is, it's a long book, so it's called major, that people are responsible for what they do. We can't blame anyone else for what we do. We're the ones that did it, not them. And now in chapter 16 of Ezekiel, he mentions uh, the proverb, like mother, like daughter. This was symbolic of Israel taking on the heathen characteristics of the land of Canaan. Now, Israel gave in to the environment of other cultures against the will of God. So as other cultures were in their society, rather than staying focused on God, they just absorbed and started doing what the other cultures were doing. They walked away from God. The environment was one of pagan worship instead of worshiping the Lord. Look at today. Does this have application today? What do you think the environment of this country will be with 10,000 people a day entering this country illegally, many of whom are not Christians? And that's at least 10,000 a day. Will these non-believers pollute the beliefs and practices of the Christians? Will they change our entire legal system? Change our constitution? It's the same thing as we see with Israel way back then in the time of Ezekiel. Now the people of Israel had misapplied the concept of judgment they were facing. They thought they were being judged due to the behavior of the previous generation. So they're suffering and they're blaming the previous generations rather than looking at themselves, what they were doing. This being the case, they would, they would pretty much assert it wouldn't make any difference how they behave because the bad stuff happening upon them was because of previous generations, so how they behave wouldn't help them. That was their false thinking. Ezekiel is explaining that they had misunderstood the scriptures. What a concept. Have you known anybody who's misunderstood scripture? Now, these Israelites who were currently in exile, and that's where they were when he's writing this, were asking, why does the son not share the guilt of his father? So what Ezekiel does, he explains it is the wickedness and righteousness that is that, that occurs within an individual and these situations, one's righteousness and somebody else's wickedness, is not transferable. So if somebody... If your father did something wicked, it does not transfer to you. If, if you do something great and, and righteous, it does not transfer to somebody else. Non-transferable. 
Now, Ezekiel will explain this very clearly. Each person will be credited or charged as a case warrants. God will look at what they did. What they did. Not anyone else around them. It's them. If I go before judgment, before God, it's, what, it's all about me, not about anyone else. Of course, I've accepted Jesus, my Lord and Savior, so I've got the not guilty stamp on me. Now, Ezekiel explains five things. That whenever a person lives righteously according to the principles of the Mosaic Covenant, he will live physically, and when he dies, he will live, live eternally. The unrighteous, those who are sinners by disobeying God's righteous way for living, as revealed in the law, will die physically and eternally. Keep in mind, none of us can keep the law, so that's a problem. We're going to go by that. A son would not be punished for the sins of his father. A father would not be punished for the sins of his son. Fourth, a righteous person lives due uh, to what is righteous. The wicked die to sin. A wicked person will live eternally if he repents. So there is, there is a escape clause here. God does not rejoice when the wicked die. God is delighted when the wicked turn to him in obedience and lives. So on your, your own behavior, how righteous and eyes of God would you be if you had not received forgiveness through Jesus? So by no longer letting sin run your life, you show you are saved and having turned from sin to God. In other words, we've got a choice. Does our life run by sin? Or do we turn to God and let him run our lives? Is he our new manager? Well, chapter 8 of Romans explains this very well. The Apostle Paul writes to us, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That is, we are forgiven. We are positioned in Christ. This is a result of having Jesus as our Lord and Savior, which frees us from the condemnation of disobeying the law. No one is good in the eyes of God. No one. Uh, Jesus speaking in Mark 10, verse 18. Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good but one, God. Or in Romans 3.23 with Paul writing us or talking to us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we are forgiven and saved due to God having sent his Son in the likeness of a of sinful man to be man's offering for sin. Those who uh, live life through their sinful nature have their minds set on sin. Those who live in accordance with the Holy Spirit have their minds set on what, what God desires. They're focused on Jesus. They're Christ-centered in their lives. The mind of a sinful man is hostility and death as well as hostility to God. Those controlled by sin cannot please God. The, uh, the mind following the Holy Spirit is full of life and peace. The Holy Spirit of God lives in those who turn their lives over to Christ Jesus. It's like an escrow company. It, it's, we are sealed. This is our guarantee. Anyone who does not have the Holy Spirit living in them does not belong to Christ or God's family. To have the Holy Spirit living in you, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is the first step in turning away from sin and how one turns to God to be saved eternally. Now as we move on, verses 24 to 29, we see that God tells us his ways are just in regards to sin. Now think of it, if, if, if the law was just, any law, law today, anywhere, everybody doing the same crime would have the same punishment. There'd be no exceptions. That would be justice. It's just, you did this, here's your, here's your, here's your uh, punishment. God is telling us his ways in regard to sin are the same way. They're just. But if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked man does, will he live? None of the righteous things he has done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness he is guilty of and because of the sins he has committed, he will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear, O house of Israel, 
Is my way unjust? Is it not your ways unjust? If a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin, he will die for it. Because of the sin he has committed, he will die. But if a wicked man turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is right and just, he will save his life. Because he considers all the offenses he has committed and turns away from them, he will surely live. He will not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? So God is just now he deals with sin, very basically. Now there was a time when a righteous man who had trusted in Messiah had, had the freedom to sin. Uh, excuse me, there was never a time. Ooh, couldn't read that. There was never a time when a righteous man who was trusted in Messiah had the freedom to sin. Many people would say this. Oh, I'm saved, so I can go on and sin because I'm saved. Um, now that person of course will die uh, if, if they believe in Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior um, but the, the thing is uh, they're still saved but the thing is if you're committing sin as a way of life but the real question is are you even saved because the Holy Spirit should be convicting you that this is wrong and you want to change it but if you just do it as a way of life with like a social path, with, with no no guilty feelings, no no desire to repent, then you're probably not a believer and are not saved. You need to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And if you believe, you're going to take action to change things. God never condones sin or grants anyone a license to disobey his commands. Uh, Paul actually writes about this in Romans. Do you still sin intentionally because you believe you have a license to do to sin due to your salvation? Now Ezekiel again reviews a statement of the exiles. They claim the way of the Lord is not just. Moreover, they're saying his ways are absurd. God's way makes no sense according to them. God's response is that the way of Israel is not his way and is inequitable as well as unrighteous. Simple logic cannot pierce determined stubbornness. Absurdity is a last refuge for those fleeing from God. A righteous man was righteous only due to being righteous and obedient to the Mosaic Covenant. So you just can't say, hey, I'm a good man or I'm righteous. That doesn't make you righteous just saying it. It's what you do. The wicked were unrighteous due to the turning away from the righteous demands of the law. So if you got somebody who says, well, when it comes to God's commandments, uh, yeah, I'll do that one, but I'm going to ignore that one. Uh, it doesn't work that way. They're a set. Either you obey the set or you disobey the set. Um, I believe it's James who writes in his book that if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. The grace of God always allowed the wicked to become righteous by repenting for their wickedness and obeying the law. So God has been a very, even in the Old Testament times, a very forgiving, but you had to participate. The righteous would die, would die if they failed to obey the law. So just because you're righteous doesn't mean you can now ignore the law. That makes you unrighteous. You cannot inherit righteousness or unrighteousness. Each person is responsible on their own to be righteous. Now today we do that with our faith and belief in Christ. We are positioned in Jesus and we are declared righteous. So God will bring justice to the unrighteous is what, Mal is, is what Ezekiel is telling us. In Malachi chapter 3 verses 3 through 18, God talks to the people that, and he has some, that, that have said some very harsh sayings against the Lord. They actually said it was futile to serve the God. They claimed that uh, they had gained nothing by serving him. They, they say this because evildoers continue to prosper. Do you see that today? Do you see evildoers continuing to prosper? Continue what they're doing, which is wrong. We all know it's wrong, but like the courts do nothing about it. Well, we got to remember God's in charge. He does things in his own time. And those who defy God cannot escape punishment. But he does make note of those who honor him, and those who honor the Lord will belong to him. 
that on the day of the Lord, there will be a distinction between followers of the Lord and those who reject him. He will spare those who revere him, those who accept him. We do that today through our faith in Jesus. Sin is forgiven by being a believer. God has compassion and gives grace to his followers. And in this way, he has shown his ways are just towards sin. He gives us a way for forgiveness. Finally, verses 30 to 32, we see that God cares for those who repent from their sin. You repent from his sin, God cares for you. Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you. Each one according to his ways declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and give a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. So God's saying right here, even in Old Testament times, he'd like everyone to be saved. He is not condemning people before birth. He's giving us all a chance based on what we decide to do. So the judgment one brings on themselves is based on their position in sin. Now the Lord concluded this message through Ezekiel by pleading with the people to repent of their sins. So he's not just sitting back, you know, having coffee, saying, well, I'll wait and see what they're going to do. He's actually pleading with the people to change their behavior and come to know him, come to be obedient to him. They're getting an invitation to live. Does God still give that invitation today? Let's look at John 3, 17 and 18. For God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he's not believed in the one and only Son of God. So it's a basic choice. Why choose um, death when you can choose life eternally? It's a choice. God doesn't send people to hell or, the, or the, 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 the lake of fire. We choose that by not having a relationship with them. Now, in the day of Ezekiel, repentance was available, and the Lord did not take delight in the death of one person who eternally dies due to sin. He does not take delight in that. He wants all to be saved. Uh, Paul writes about that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is good. And it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to knowledge of the truth. Or when Paul writes in 10.13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't see any exceptions in there. It's just that simple. God does not predestine anyone to the lake of fire or to hell other than those who reject Jesus. The predestination is the result of rejecting Jesus. But we, everyone has the opportunity to accept him. In, the, in these verses in Ezekiel, the Lord is exhorting the people to repent and live. The focus of these verses is the need for Israel to take responsibility for their sin, repent, and turn to God. Today, we repent by putting our faith and belief in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Now, you know God cares for you even when you sin by repenting. Um, we can kind of look at some of the things today that we, we see from uh, what I call psychobabble, but psychology, that argues that a person is a brat, oddball, alcoholic, drug addict, and so forth as a result of how their parents treated them. This could be neglect from uh, physical or emotional abuse. Ezekiel is instructing us, we stand alone before God. We can't blame anyone else. There's a point where we are mature enough or are supposed to mature enough, or we're adults, we make our own decisions, and we need to start taking responsibility for ourselves. We are accountable for our actions, not anyone else's. Why do we sin? Because we are sinners. We have the sin nature in us. Every person will stand before God, will not be able to blame anyone else for their actions. But we do have a solution that God gives us. There is a solution. And that is to becoming cleansed of our sins. 
not just whitewashed over with paint that eventually peels and shows the old coat, but literally be washed clean. The solution is Jesus. So we see here that we are shown that a person who turns from his sin and turns to God will be saved. God tells us his ways are just in regards to sin, and that we see God cares for those who repent from their sin. Have you repented from your sin? If not, this is a good time to pray for the Holy Spirit to come into you, turn your life in the care of uh, Christ Jesus, accept him as your Lord and Savior, and turn your life over to God. May God bless you, and I hope you have a wonderful 2024. Thank you, Michael. And yes, um, James 2.10, I looked it up while you were preaching, that says if you've broken one, you've broken them all. That would be another good topic for, for a sermon. I love that when being in church and you're you know, discussing God's word and worshiping God and glorifying God and more topics to preach on come up. <coughs> so our announcements, uh, we have Bible study this Wednesday. Bible study this Wednesday at 7 p.m., 7 to 8 p.m. Everybody's welcome. Uh, yeah, Sunday morning at uh, 9.30 to 10.30. Everybody is welcome. We're in uh, First Peter on uh, Sunday mornings. And you guys in Ruth? Uh, actually, we did all of Ruth last week. Oh, okay. So you're going to the next book? For Samuel. For Samuel. Oh, the Samuels. I love the Samuels. There's just so much. Of course, there's so much in every book of the Bible, but... Oh goodness, it's just so much there in the Samuels. First and second Samuel, that is. Okay, um, our closing song is number 406. The Solid Rock. And of course, speaking of Jesus. On Christ the Solid Rock I stand. Yes. So if you are sinking, know that you are not standing with Jesus. You're not standing on the rock. Sinking sand, all on the ground is sinking.
thinking sign. Amen. Amen. Yeah, when it goes into the chorus on that song, it's like there's no reason for it to hold it as long as it did. That's like a that's what a quarter note there at the end. They chose. But they chose to do it that way, so God is good. You know, I think about the, the, the hymns, and I'm just so thankful to all of those people who felt gone through the Holy Spirit, putting the songs on their hearts, and that they actually sat there and, that, you know, they wrote them down. They're good examples for us, and when we know that God is leading us through the Holy Spirit, that we follow that, that if indeed it's God, then he's going to give you the strength and the courage to do whatever it is that he's leading you forth to do. As we uh, close out the worship service, um, I want to put forth the challenge, which I do every year. Usually I do it in a sermon, but Michael was here this year. Um, usually in my sermon I will uh, challenge everybody to open up the Word of God for yourself. Day in and day out. Uh, if a doing it in a routine way helps you, then by all means do it that way. Uh, but if, if you don't like routine, then do open up God's word anyways. And read it. Ask God what it is that he would have you see there. Uh, and always pray. Always pray before you open up the Word of God and ask God to, to help and guide you through the Holy Spirit to understand what the Word of God is saying. Um, so many people will turn on the television, and, and I'm not being judgmental here because I do it as well. Uh, so many people will sit there and turn on the television and take much enjoyment in spending a few hours watching a TV show. Nowadays, we stream it. You know, we, we watch like a whole... Seven seasons of a show in, in one sitting, which is basically all day. And not once did we listen to a sermon or sing a worship song or open up the Word of God and read it. Now, some people out there that are very creative and... and um, hopefully following the Lord's guidance, and I, and I believe that they are, they've started to put the Bible in a TV series. In very, I'm not going to mention some of them because some of them I don't think are sound, uh, but there, there are on different uh, streaming programs, there is one wonderful book. It's called The Gospel of John. And it is verbatim. It's the Gospel of John, and it's, they're using the good, uh, the good News Bible. And every word that's spoken is straight out of the Gospel of John. And then, of course, you have the, the actors are dramatizing it. You know, they're acting it out. And there's some artistic in, in, uh, expression in there. However, every single word that's spoken is from directly... The Gospel of John, the Good News translation. So I, I highly recommend that. And uh, there are uh, wonderful down-to-earth TV shows out there um, that you can watch. That you don't have to watch all the ones where you know every few seconds you're having to cover your eyes so you don't see you know a sexual thing going on, or you don't have to close your ears. And so let me just, again, let me just challenge everybody to uh, open up the Word of God for yourself. Spend the time that you would spend watching television. Spend it in the Word. And that's, I believe that's going to be my new, that will be my New Year's resolution for this year is to watch less TV and spend more time in the Word. And, you know, you can, with the TVs the way they are today, you can take a sermon that's in a video and you can cast it up onto your TV. So you'll have that watching the TV, but it'll be a sermon that's being, like you could take our YouTube channel, get it on your phone, on your YouTube app, 
And then you can cast it to your smart TV. We could do that with this TV right here even. If ever there was a Sunday where there was no pastor and nobody felt led, we could just chime into the YouTube channel and put one of our other sermons, one of our other worship services up there. So, okay, I go on. <clears throat> so, uh, most heavenly Father, Lord, I ask for your uh, continued hedge of protection around everybody here and around everybody that's listening, around our church, the church property, our neighbors. <clears throat> Lord, we um, ask for your healing on all of those who are sick, uh, the different people with a continuous, a continuous cough or a sore throat or a dry mouth or um, a cold, um, all those different ailments that we feel in our body, Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, in, in anything that's you know, quite harmful to us as well, Lord, we ask for your healing. Lord, we ask for your, your healing hands upon each one of us that we may uh, go forward into the new year more healthy so that we're able to do more ministry in your name. And uh, be with each one of us as we travel. Be with all of our family members. Lord, we ask that you be with every person out there that's, that's going to do something to uh, manipulate manipulate the way that they feel, whether that be drugs or alcohol or, or, or food but mainly with the drugs and alcohol, Lord, keep them off the road or just keep them from, bring somebody in their life to keep them from using these substances. Lord, would you ask that? We, we all know people and love people um, that have issues with these areas. Uh, and but by your grace, go we, Lord. Again, uh, we love you, Lord, and we ask all of these things. And through your son's precious name, thank you, Father. Amen. Amen.